Hey, huh. welcome to the future. <laughs> <laughs> no, nothing. What do you mean? <laughs> thought you were going to say the paranoia suits you. Okay. <laughs> I thought we were doing a bit. Can we, we restart this? We... I... <laughs> All right, SK, roll the intro again. Hey, welcome back, everyone. A new episode of Steins Gate. So it is. Now in the future. <laughs> with no bits around it. <laughs> Don't worry about it. Kagari, from now on, you're officially my daughter. Yay, old lady, Mayuri. <laughs> old lady? She's like, what? She's like our age. Now. Yeah, she's like 30. <laughs> Wait, no, this is the 2030s. So she'd be 40s? Would she? Cuz she's like what? 16ish in the in like 2010. Add on another 26 years to get her to 2036. Okay. Yeah, yeah, she's she's in her early 40s. This was when Kagari was 6. She'd been living in a facility for war orphans and getting treatment at a dedicated clinic next door. It was a completely different place than the normal hospitals, which were overflowing with casualties from the war. It was an idyllic garden, shut off from the despair of the outside world, so that children could live in peace. That was where she'd met her mom. Mom, Maya Rishina, was a class two caregiver at the facility, who was always very nice to her. Interesting. So does Mayushi go on and get a nursing degree or something? I could sounds see it. Sounds like it, yeah. Like that that definitely sounds like something she'd do. That would do. track. Really? You're gonna be my real mommy? Yup, that's right. Yay! Mommy! And that's all it takes. <laughs> As it turns out, all you have to do is sign a piece of paperwork sometimes. And even then, you don't really have to. <laughs> Family is where you find it. It was impossible to express with words how happy Kagari had felt. Being mom's real daughter meant that Kagari had become her real name. Kagari became Kagari Shina. Hey, don't hug me so tight. <laughs> You're so spoiled, Kagari. Then I can leave, right? I can live with you, right? Ah. <sighs> I'm sorry. It looks like you need a little more treatment. That's right. Oh, doctor. Kagari didn't know the doctor's name, but he was a nice old man who was always kind to her. Actually, you should probably be this character, shouldn't you? It's going to be another six months, and then it's over. You'll just have to hang in there until then. Six months. When we talked about this before, you said two weeks. I was referring to her physical wounds. The post-traumatic stress suffered by children during the great bombing of Tokyo far exceeds that of adults. Man, name a science adventure game that doesn't feature Japan, that doesn't feature Tokyo specifically getting destroyed. Steinsgate? Gestures. This is zero. Okay, but in the future of Steins Gate, they have to avoid Tokyo from... There's a third world war. <laughs> right. <coughs> <coughs> Though, doesn't that only show up at, like... How much of that is in original Steins Gate? I don't even remember What do you mean how point. much... Of, that's the future they're trying to explicitly avoid. Isn't the future okay, they're trying not... to avoid the CERN dystopia, which is decidedly not this? But also, the CERN dystopia and also this. Okay. It's both. <laughs> and we learned at her exam yesterday that she's still having nightmares. Is that true, Kagari? That, that's not true. I don't have nightmares anymore. It's all fun dreams. Fun, fun, fun. Hmm. Kagari, it's not good to lie. It'll only make your treatment take longer. Aww. You told me yesterday that you wake up with nightmares all the time still, didn't you? Yeah. Oh my, I see. 
It's proof that the memories of the bombing still exist in her mind as terrifying experiences. If we don't treat them properly, it could lead to irreversible consequences. You're right. So, you don't mind if we continue with her treatment, do you, Mom? Oh, of course. Kagari, let's do our best and beat the bad sickness, okay? I like how she still wears blue. <laughs> and the same hat. The same hat. It just looks smaller now yeah. <laughs> relative to her being fully grown. Mom rubbed her head. Kagari felt so at peace that she could cry. <clears throat> okay. Yep, that's my girl. Okay. See you later, Kagari. Mommy. Mom took her hand away, and instead the doctor took Kagari's hand. She was taken to the usual room. There was a white reclining chair, and next to it some kind of mechanical system connected to a headset. I can hear the same voice as always. You need to protect your mother, protect this world. That's why you were born. She couldn't remember when she started hearing the voice. But by the time she was six, whenever she was worried, uncertain, or in trouble, she could hear it. It was always kind and strong, and it always cheered her up. In Kagari's childish mind, she started to think it might be the voice of God. Since only she could hear it, everyone else said it was just an illness. But Mom was the one person who believed her. I need to protect Mommy, so I need to work hard at my treatment. Kagari's young heart was filled with the hope that she could someday live with Mom. As soon as she opened the door, Kagari Shina was struck by an unpleasant wave of heat. It was in early June, and this was the first day to hit summer temperatures. It was hot enough that just walking outside could cause you to sweat, but this small, Japanese-style room had thick curtains, and the windows were closed. The room was dark and cramped, and there were so many clothes on the floor that there was no place to stand. It wasn't just clothes, there were all kinds of filthy things. Bags with half-eaten snack bread still in them. Half-rotted food pla packs. Plastic convenience store bags overflowing with trash. All scattered around on the floor. Moeka detected. <laughs> Moeka detected. Oh my god, and she's not- She's wounded. And the area around the half-naked girl sitting against the wall was covered in bandages and gauze, soaked with blood and pus. There were bandages tied around her exposed stomach, chest, and limbs, but these were too so these too were soaked with blood. The room was filled with a sickeningly sweet stench, though there was no way to know if it was coming from the garbage or coming from her. Hmm. The owner of the room, Moeka Kiryu, raised her head and looked at her eyes, filled with hope. M4, you're still alive? When she saw Kagari, who was still wearing her shoes as she came into the room, her shoulders slumped. You're not FB. Who are you? That's an awful thing to say to the person who saved your life. <clears throat> Interesting. Moeka gave a painful cough and spit up some stomach fluid mixed with blood. It stained her thighs and the floor. <gasps> her wounds must have opened again because the bandages around her stomach began to turn red. She'd spent five months like this with no treatment from a doctor. Moeka had gotten into a gunfight with the Russian army and failed her mission as a rounder. She'd lost two of her companions, and her target, Kurusu Makase's laptop, was also destroyed. They pinned the blame on her. She was wounded and almost killed. It was Kalgari who saved her and brought her to this room. <sighs> so she's been five months without getting those wounds treated? <laughs> Jesus, fuck. Your hair is in remarkably good condition for not having gotten cut in that long. <laughs> but if someone with a gunshot wound went to the hospital, the police would be notified. And for that reason, she'd never gotten any real treatment. Her wounds had become infected, and even five months later, they still brought her incredible pain. 
Her terrible fever hadn't let up at all, and it wasn't rare for it to go from 39 to over 40. But Moika didn't seem very interested in her wounds. She was more interested in sending messages with the phone in her hands. She must have been sending more messages to her beloved boss. In the past five months, she'd send nearly a, thou a thousand. Why, FB, why won't you answer me? FB was Moeka's boss in the Rounders, a woman who always gave orders to Moeka via text message. Moeka worshipped her, to a degree that far exceeded what would occur could occur within a normal employee relationship. The shock of being abandoned by FB had hurt her many times more than her actual wounds. Kagari tossed the bag she had slung over her shoulder at Moeka's feet, along with two plastic bags. The backpack was filled with medicine that wasn't available without a doctor's prescription. Along with it was a whole box of illegal drugs, used only for the treatment of severe pain. Normally these would be kept under strict control at a hospital where nor no normal person could get them. Both the plastic bags were filled with canned goods, and other things Kagri had chosen because they had the lowest probability of spoiling. If you don't feel like living anymore, tell me. I'll bring you poison instead. But Moika didn't seem to notice Kagri at all anymore. She was completely unresponsive. Kagri had gotten used to her attitude over the last five months, but she wasn't just going to go home today. She wordlessly reached for Moika's cell phone. What are you doing? Moika tried to resist, but evidently she had no strength left. Kagri was easily able to grab the phone. It was covered in blood and pus, and Kagri forced it into her pocket without hesitation. Give it back. Moeka started crawling towards her. It was like something out of a zombie movie. Don't get the wrong idea. You've got new orders from FB. Moeka froze. O orders from FB? Yeah, take it. Kagari took another cell phone out of her pocket. It was the same Japanese cell phone that Moiga had been using, minus the dirt and blood stains. The phone you've been using is under surveillance by the Russians and Americans, so she can't use it. So from now on, your orders will come in via this. Moika reached a trembling hand out toward the phone. And in an instant, she snatched it away and clutched it to her chest like it was her own child. Will FB send me messages if I... Have this phone? You should have some already. Moika quickly opened the screen on the phone. When she saw the words on the screen, tears started to flow down her face. <laughs> M4, my beloved daughter. It must have been so hard for you. I know it was hard for me. Your failure was unfortunate, but I'm very glad you're alive. Get better and wait for my next message, okay? This time, complete your mission successfully and regain my trust. I believe in you from the bottom of my heart. To my beloved daughter from FB. <laughs> You didn't need to read it aloud. Of course, this message wasn't from FB. Kagari had written it herself. Keep someone at the brink of death for five months and give them exactly what they want as bait, and you can easily put anyone under your control. Kagari knew this well. Hmm. The life suddenly returned to Moeka's face. She spilled out the contents of Kagari's backpack like a woman possessed. I want to get better. I need to regain FB's trust. That's right, M4. Kagari smiled, satisfied, and knelt down in front of her. I'll treat you. Take off these bandages. When Kagari left the apartment the sun had set, she spent several hours treating Moeka's wounds. Her hands still smelled of medicine. It wouldn't go away for days, possibly. She sighed and put on her full-face motorcycle helmet, then went to the parking lot and got on her bike. I wonder if I'll hear the voice of God soon. She whispered.
She took off on her motorcycle. It was almost July. The rainy season hadn't been that bad this year, and what little remained of it had already disappeared. Temperature-wise, summer had come a long time ago. Summer. Oh, right, we're back to Okabe now. Yeah. Uh, in other words, it had almost been a year since it happened. Gate, gate. Gate, gate. <laughs> Forgot about gate, gate. And then, one Saturday afternoon, if I stayed home, not only would it be hot, but Dad would be on my case about helping with the family business. Uh, to get away, I'd come to the area around Ikebokuro Station. A year ago, I could have gone to the lab, but with Suzuha living there now, I mostly stopped going. But that meant it was hard to find a place to study on my days off. It was too much trouble to go to the university, and the classrooms probably weren't open on weekends anyway. After a lot of research, I'd settled on spending my free days visiting this cafe near my parents' home and spending a few hours there. Okabe hanging out in store box. Right. In fact, a lot of the other patrons did the same thing I did, buying a single cup of coffee and sitting there for hours on end. You know what I miss? That? Doing the crossword in the local cafe with you over a cup of coffee. I miss that. I miss that so much. <laughs> we, Because c- we used to, like, um... It's not there anymore. Which is yeah, sad. they replaced it with another much worse cafe where I got the worst cup of espresso that I've had in years. And this was all still pre-COVID, too. Yeah. Right? It's like... Everything closed because of COVID and got replaced with worse versions. Yeah. It was the best place. We would go down there, we'd grab a copy of the local paper, and just do the crossword with one another, and, you know, it was really nice. It was. In fact, a lot of the other paper... Yeah, yeah, yeah. Some brought books, some brought computers... I chuckled to myself as I realized that I joined the ranks of the other normies. Tutoru, where are you now? <sighs> Here's a very convenient rind sticker of me drinking coffee. Oh, the usual cafe, right? I just went to your place and you weren't home. You did? Did my dad make a nuisance of himself again? It's okay. He gave me some barley tea. You you brought me around to barley tea. <laughs> you did. I I, I, well, I didn't believe. And you started making iced barley tea, and it is refreshing and wonderful. It's pretty good. I should make more. You should. I have to go shopping. Will you come with me? Okay. Thank you. Okay. I'll leave now. Wait for me. So she went to my house. My family's business was called Okabe Green Grocer. It was a beat-up old store located in a rundown shopping street. The place was almost 40 years old at this point. I really wanted them to rebuild it. Was this the lead-up to the first <sighs> end that we did, the really bad one? This is very similar so far. Because there was, like, the, there was the raid on that where they, they, they got attacked, and then... Right, but that happened they, differently. It happened differently, and then they... Um, go back to America and then it's a couple months later and then Mako yep. comes back but is brainwashed. Yeah, this is very similar. Yeah. But some things are still different. Uh, I can see if I can hit skip and see if it's... I, I, I don't... You don't have to. Yeah, I'm pretty sure. It's been ages so I don't remember what actually happens here anymore other than like, I could have sworn he started going to Starbucks yeah, way yeah. back in this playthrough. Yeah. My mind had wandered. Mayuri was going to be here in less than 15 minutes so maybe it was time to call it a day. I'd worked pretty hard during the morning, so it wasn't too bad. I was a little surprised at how hard I'd been working lately. I could feel how having a goal gave me energy. I needed to get to Victor Condria University as soon as I could. Victor Condria University. What's up, fucker? <laughs> I was still in contact with Maho via email and chat. She was evidently busy with her research because she was always sleepy. I finally feel motivated again because now I have another scientist woman who's completely sick of my shit. It turns out this is what it takes for me to have any sort of forward momentum in life. <laughs> I don't know what that says about me, but I'm trying not to think about it right now. I took out my phone. I found myself looking for a certain icon on the home screen, but of course I deleted it myself six months ago. Amadeus, was Kurosu doing well? 
knowing her, she probably was coming up with some complicated theory or teasing Maho. It's also possible she was visiting at channel and hiding it from Maho. <laughs> at channel, huh? And that's right, Kurusu had internet access, so it would make sense if she accessed at channel. But uh, given that, could Amadeus post on message boards? Kurusu had spent a lot of effort last summer trying to argue with John Titor on at channel. That happened to the Alpha World line, though. Still, it meant she was okay with posting. So there was a chance that Kurusu was doing the same thing as well. If Amadeus had even temporary access to the network, then maybe. Just maybe. I opened the web browser on my smartphone and, without really expecting much, ran a search for a nickname I knew I'd never forget. Curry Gohan and Kamehameha. It was the handle that Kurusu had once used. Whoa! I spoke without thinking. I bowed my head a little toward the other customers who were staring at me coldly and looked back at my smartphone. Amazingly, the search turned up several hundred results. They were all comments on at channel. I took a look at the dates on the results page. The oldest dated back to 2008. It must have been written by Kurusu when she was alive. I never expected to see traces of her here. Wait, did she really need to post this much? I didn't realize she spent this much time on at channel. <laughs> her comments were spread out on a lot of different boards. Physics, mathematics, science fiction, and, of course, the occult boards. For example, in the science fiction thread, she'd had passionate discussions about time machines. But unlike in the Alpha World line, she never came out and denied the possibility of a time machine. Surprisingly, some of her comments seemed to be quite the opposite. No, I guess that's not surprising at all. After all, she'd gone through all the work required to write a paper on time machines. Compared to that, her comments on the occult boards were brutal. She would absolutely crush the arguments of anyone who dared propose anything even the least bit scientific. Supernatural phenomena like crop circles, poltergeists, and spontaneous human combustion. Out of place artifacts, the Mayan doomsday calendar, conspiracy theories about how human DNA had been brought from another planet. She broke them down and refuted them with a cold thought... with a cold thoroughness that even drove away her own side. And if anyone dared challenge her, she'd leave them flat on the canvas. It was just like Kurosu. Her comments offered so little room for discussion, it was aggravating to read them. Did she actually enjoy all this occult stuff? She had put enough energy into this that I couldn't help but wonder. This is just too much. First time I met her at last year's ATF, I'd gone through the same experience. But, after a certain point, the Curry Gohan and Kamehameha comments suddenly stopped. The cutoff date was July 27th of last year. The day Kurisu died. Her last comment was a slightly too heated response to someone who was mocking Dr. Nakabachi's time machine press conference. <sighs> My chest tightened with the sensations of nostalgia and sorrow. I decided to close the browser, but then I stopped as soon as I saw her next comment. I brought the phone closer to my face and stared at it again and again. The date of the comment was December 1st, 2010. This can't be. Kurusu died in July 2010, so this couldn't possibly be her, so who was it? Was it someone else who'd taken over the identity of Kuri Gohan and Kamehameha? Or was it... Since there was no trip code, I couldn't tell for certain. December 1st was just after Maho and Dr. Leskinen had come to Japan, and also about the time I'd encountered Kurusu. After that, Kuri Gohan and Kamehameha commented at about a rate of once per week. I looked for the most recent comment. Oh, wait, that's last night. It was a discussion about relativity theory. So, you're one of those people who thinks that the Michelson-Morley experiment led to the development of relativity theory? No wonder you weren't making any sense. Go back to grade school, fool. <laughs> no point in even talking to you. <laughs> she really did get foul-mouthed when she went on at channel. But then I realized that she had said the same thing to me face to face. If this wasn't some imposter, this if this really was Kurusu. What a miraculous and yet stupid story. 
<laughs> Did Maho and Dr. Leska didn't know about this, I wonder? Probably not. Kurusu wasn't going to tell them. I couldn't help but laugh. Should I try to make contact with her? I wanted to see if this Kuri Gohan and Kamehameha really was Kurusu. And then I came up with a good handle. Sally Ari's neighbor. Of course this was a knockoff of Maho's ID. If Kuri Gohan and Kamehameha really was Kurusu, she'd have to notice, right? Alright. <laughs> I thought I smelled moron. It is true the original purpose of that experiment was only to prove the existence of ether, but you can't deny that it helped Einstein. As a result, you can say that if on the basis of his theories, someone needs to go back to school. And it ain't me. <laughs> and there, it's posted. How about that? I wrote something deliberately provocative, and importantly, I mixed in some mistakes. Not to brag, but I thought I knew a lot more about Kurusu than Maho did. <laughs> deliberately making mistakes to bait the response. Yep. If it is Kurusu, this will fish her right in. Oh, Karin. Oh, my. A wild Mayuri appeared. At some point, Mayuri had walked up in front of me. Oh, you're here already. Been so busy writing my comments that I hadn't noticed. I hurriedly put the phone away and stood up. All right, you ready to go? Hmm. Oh, huh? what's wrong? Nothing. Let's go. Oh, was Okabe smiling or something? <laughs> <laughs> and she's like, what? What happened? What happened? Mayuri and I left the cafe. Because I'm pretty sure last time we saw this scene, Amadeus came with them, right? Or or Amadeus called in the middle of them helping out. Yeah, because yeah. he was still a tester. Yep. He was an overseas tester at that point. Yeah. Pencil cross pencil. Mayuri and I met up and headed for Tokyo Hands. When I stepped inside the air-conditioned store, I felt refreshed. If this was, If it was this hot in June, I'd shudder to think what it was going to be like in July or August. So, what are you going to buy? Um, we're going to make some signs for advertising. So I need poster board and highlighters and stuff. Are you going to put out a book this year at this year's Komima? Nope, it's for Oka Bay Green Grocer. What? What did you say? My family business. When I went to your house today, I talked to your dad about it. And I said that Mayushi would make them for him. Oh, wait, seriously? My dad could be such a jerk. There's really no reason you have to do that. But, but, Mayushi wants to do it. Uh, are you sure? Your mom and dad are always so nice to me. All right, and I'll let you get something as a thank you present. I'll get you something as a thank you present, then. Really? That makes me so happy. Would you like something from... Died Tidbrul? <laughs> <laughs> I took a quick look around and saw what they were selling. I saw that they were selling a lot of things you could use for advertising. I decided to mostly leave the purchasing decisions up to Myri. She spent quite a while deciding what to buy. But, well, maybe because of all the time she spent at May Queen plus Neon Square, her taste ran in the direction of cute and anime. Hey, hey, don't you think this heart shape is cute? Uh, how are you going to use a heart shape to sell fruits and vegetables? Hmm? Well, how about this? Mr. Matsutake is thick and sturdy. Why not take him home tonight, ma'am? <laughs> uh... <laughs> Mayuri, I... Or maybe... <laughs> try my juicy ripe melons. Mayuri, have you been getting suggestions from Daru? <laughs> no comment. <laughs> Daru didn't brainwash you while I wasn't looking, did he? <laughs> huh? No, no, never mind. Myri looked confused. Confused and completely oblivious. Anyway, no heart shapes. It'll look like we're up to something that we shouldn't be. Really? I think it's cute. It doesn't have to be cute. That's what I'm trying to say here. My original intention was not to interfere. My original intention not to interfere had gone by the wayside. 
Anyway, if you buy any more than this, you're going to have extras. My shopping cart was filled with cardstock of various colors and shapes. This will last us for a long time already. You're right. Okay, let's go then. We went to the cash register to check out. And since it was a Saturday, the checkout area was overflowing with shopping carts. Since it was going to take a while, I sent Mayuri to browse the toy section on another floor. I knew they'd have some stuff from one of her favorite shows, Rainette Kakaru. Mayuri looked apologetic, but did what I told her to. In the end, I waited a whole 15 minutes at the register. As an apology, I decided to get the present I had promised her. <laughs> she seemed really happy as she stared at the keychain. It was Upa, the mascot character from the Rynet Kakaroo series. I told her when she went over to the toy section that she could pick out anything she wanted, and this is what she chose. You seem pretty happy about that, given how many Upas you already have. And that's a regular green Upa, right? Not the rare one. The rare one? Do you mean the metal Upa? The most popular and rarest of the Upas was the shiny silver metal Upa. For example, whenever there was a lottery for rare Ryan and Kakaru stuff at the convenience stores, the top prize was always a metal Upa. Mayuri had told me once that they sold for tens of thousands of yen at an auction. <laughs> for some reason, Mayuri was wagging her finger at me. No. This is a green Upa, but it's not a regular one. This is the green fairy Upa that was in the movie they just released. Come to think of it, there had been a Rynet Kakaroo movie come out in spring. Had Mayuri sat in a theater full of little kids just to watch it? The Green Fairy? Is it okay if I spoil the movie? Oh, go ahead. I'm not going to see it. So, this movie, it's about a fight with an evil super hacker in the virtual world. Alright. The virtual world is a forest where the fairies live. We've definitely seen a version of this scene before, because I remember thinking that this just sounds like Digimon. <laughs> Mr. Super Hacker is really strong, and Kakeru and Upa are in big trouble, but... But? Just when they're about to lose, the fairies come to save them. And it turns out that the fairies are actually the flowers in the school garden that he'd always taken care of. They came all the way to the virtual world to save Kakeru. And then there was this big shiny light, and then they combined with Upa. I see. And that's Green Fairy Upa. He's really cute and really strong. Mayushi thought it was so great. I love stories like that. The director's a genius. I... I see. It was rare for Mayuri to get this excited about something. I took a closer look and saw that the design was a little different from the standard Upa. I didn't know a lot about Upas, so I couldn't exact say exactly what was different. I've actually been spending a lot of time looking for this keychain. It's really popular, so it's sold out everywhere. I never would have thought Hans would have one. Huh, you were pretty lucky then, huh? Yup, and it was the last one. I'm glad I came today. I need to thank you and your dad. Myri took the tag off the keychain, got her house key out of her bag, and carefully attached it. Hey, Okarin, Mayushi will treasure this forever and ever and ever. Yes, please do. Make sure you don't lose it five minutes after you've gotten it. It happened before, after all. Like the metal Upa I'd won for her at the radio building. Mayuria had lost it no more than five minutes after I gave it to her. Wondered if she'd ever found it. I didn't really want to remember that time in my life, so my memory of what happened to the metal Upa was vague. Yeah, I'm never gonna lose it again. The two of us started to head back. I'm gonna work hard and make the ads for your shop, okay? Alright. Yeah, you've still got to do that, don't you? I'd been thinking the job was done once we bought the materials, but... The real work actually began now. Should I help as well, or...? No, I'm fine. Believe in Mayushi. Alright then, I'm a little worried. After you tried to buy heart-shaped cardstock, but, uh... It's fine. Well, it's nice of you to make them at all, so I shan't complain. Oh, I need to call Mom. I'll tell her that I'll be home for dinner. 
Why not eat at my place? I'm sure either mom or dad will try to get you to stay anyway. Hmm, I don't know. Are you going to stay at home the rest of today? You won't go to any singles parties. I'm sorry, what? I haven't been to any lately, so... Last fall when I'd been forcing myself to become a normal college kid, I'd tried to go to as many as possible, but... Lately I'd been so busy with my studies I hadn't had a chance. I see. Then maybe I will. Myri took out her phone and started to type something when... Hmm... Her expression suddenly darkened. She stopped moving. What's wrong? Um, I just got a message from Kaide. I didn't notice it. What should I do, Okarin? Myri seemed like she was on the verge of tears. Uh, did something happen? Hmm. Hey, Okarin. You told me before that Fubuki's not sick, right? Fubuki? You mean Nakase? Not Kurishima, right? Yeah, is that true? She's really not sick. Uh, yes, I, d I don't believe so. But... Myri showed me her phone. Fubuki is back in the hospital. I'm on my way. Here's the location. She's back in the hospital? I couldn't believe what I was seeing on the screen. Uh, hold on one sec, everyone. There we go. Sorry about that. We're all right back now. <laughs> I'm back in my cop voice. <laughs> and I ain't quite sure why, but I'm going to narrate this here section with <laughs> this. Oh, no. <laughs> no, I'm not going to do that. I don't know why that was the one I slipped into, but apparently there it was. Fubuki was at a different location than before. This time it was the AH Tokyo General Hospital High Tech Medical Center in Yoyogi. It was supposedly one of Japan's most advanced hospitals. According to what I read on the internet, patients with the new encephalitis that everyone was talking about were being gathered here for special treatment. But I also read lots of really bad urban legends about the place. I was a bit worried about what kind of horror show I'd find there. Of course, when we arrived, it was nothing like that. It was very clean and decorated like a luxury hotel. Mayuri and Okarine. Come over here! It's this way! Kaide and Yuki waved at us, to us as we entered the lobby. Yuki had gotten a message from Kaede as well, and had evidently come right over. Where's Fubuki? Oh, she's doing fine! Yuki gave Mayuri a soft hug and a smile. Kaide bowed her head apologetically. I'm sorry to scare you. I was kind of in a hurry myself. I should have checked more carefully before I messaged you. What do you mean? Uh, how is Nakase doing? I just let her mom and met her mom in the hospital room, and it doesn't look like her illness has gotten any worse. Then they've just brought her here for more examinations or something? That's right. Uh, that's what they said. So there's nothing to worry about. Oh, I'm so glad. Mari looked extremely relieved as Yuki continued to hug her. I I'm a cyborg now. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. If I remembered right, the last time they examined her, they said it was possible she had the disease, but as long as it didn't get worse, it wouldn't affect her daily life. They just told her to come back for regular checkups. The new encephalitis had arrived in Japan over six months ago, but the number of patients was still increasing. Fortunately, there hadn't been a single casualty yet. Even Funny though that. Nakase was now a cyborg. <laughs> I'm pretty sure that's no illness, though. I was certain that what they were calling encephalitis was actually something similar to reading Steiner. One time when I went to visit Fubuki in the hospital, I had secretly investigated the other patients. I wasn't able to get any proof, but I found out most of the patients in her wing had, to varying degrees, memories of the same world line. Many people had memories of Japan at war. Can we see Fubuki? They say they're doing an MRI to look at her brain right now. 
so she's not in her room. I see. But it will be done soon. Kabuki's mom told us to wait here. Kaede motioned to Mayuri, indicating she should sit down at a nearby sofa. Once the exam is done, she's going to come get us. I let the girls sit down on the sofa and stood next to them while I surveyed the lobby. This is an amazing hospital, isn't it? Uh, yeah, it really is. Is Nakase's family really rich or something? If she's staying in a place like this, I mean. No, that's not it. Fubuki's mom says that the Japanese and American governments are paying for a new treatment project. It's going to be centered around this lab and a dedicated hospital in America, supposedly. Oh, I, I see. I wasn't sure how I felt about that. If I was right about what this disease really was, it was hard to imagine a bigger waste of money. Please, give all the patients private rooms and try to keep the rooms as far apart from one another as possible to ensure the patients don't come into contact. Uh, but there aren't that many open rooms, buddy. You need to do it anyway. If the patients talk to each other, they'll start to share the dreams, right? Okay, sure, that's true, but, uh... Once a person hears about someone else's dream, their brain can trick them into thinking they had that dream as well. Across the lobby, I saw an old Japanese doctor in a white coat, and a big man in a suit who was frantically trying to talk to him. Oh! I'd seen the man in the suit before. Actually, it was a man I knew well. A p -p professor Professor Leskinen! I hurried over. Uh, Dr. Leskinen, I it's me, Okabe. He must have been wearing his translator, because he was communicating with the old doctor in Japanese. Dr. Leskinen's face quickly broke into a smile when he saw me. Oh, Lintalo. His voice was so loud that everyone in the lobby, doctors and nurses, staff, and even the patients, turned to look at me. But Dr. Leskinen didn't seem to notice them as he ran over. He was like a giant American football player racing for a touchdown. Huh? Oh, wait, wait, Professor, stop, stop. Oh! Oh! My cries went unheard as Dr. Leskinen tackled me and then pulled me up. He then switched from football player to pro wrestler and swung me up and down. I felt like I was a little child. There was nothing I could do to resist him as he flung me around. A moment later, he noticed the cold stares of the people around us and finally released me. Oh my, I'm sorry. I was so surprised I got a little too excited. Dr. Leskinen bowed to the people around him in apology. The doc- Uh, Dr. Leskinen, who is this young man? The doctor that Professor Leskinen had been talking to and was given a very silly voice, <laughs> was staring at me suspiciously. Oh, I'm, uh, well, I wasn't sure exactly what to tell him. It wasn't like he was really my professor. You seem to be a student. What school are you with? You're studying brain science like the professor, then, uh... Uh, no, no, I'm, uh... He'll be a student at Victor Condria this September. I'm planning on having him come to my lab. What? I see. Victor Condria, huh? That's quite a surprise. I looked over at Dr. Leskinen questioningly, but he just gave me a mischievous smile. This guy, he really was such a kid. Very rare for a Japanese student to be able to go there. I'm impressed. Oh, th th thank you. <laughs> <laughs> After the doctor left, I sighed loudly enough for Professor Leskinen to hear me. <sighs> so, who was that guy? The director of this hospital. Oh, the director? Director? You just told a lie to someone that important? Oh, did I lie? I said you'd be a student starting in September, but I didn't mean this September. Or what? Do you think you don't have what it takes to make it to my school in the end? That's a little unfortunate, but... He really was like a little kid. Completely shameless. <laughs> but still, it was hard to hate him. I'm surprised, though. I had no idea you were here in Japan. It had been five months since I'd seen him off at Narita. I looked around for Maho, but I didn't see her anywhere. Where's the small Lilliputian that follows you around? <laughs> small isn't, little what? Isn't that what they call her in, in the anime instead of a lolly? What? They go with the, the Lilliputian. Oh, yeah. Which is from Gulliver's Travels. Yeah, 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 right? yeah. 
Are you not feeling well, Lintolo? Did you come here for treatment? Oh, no, I'm, I'm here to visit a friend. Oh, I see. That's good. Well, it's not good for your friend. I'm sorry. Oh, no, it's, uh... uh so what are you doing here at a Japanese hospital? Dr. Leskinen brought his face close to mine and whispered so the people around us couldn't hear him. You've heard about the new encephalitis cases, right? The American government asked our psychophysiology lab to look into it, but they've hit a roadblock. The university ordered me to help with the investigation. I see. So you're helping with the new encephalitis cases? There was a word I didn't expect to hear. I explained that my friend was here because they thought she might have the disease. Is your friend named Katsumi Nakase, perhaps? Oh, yes, you've met her at the Christmas party, didn't you? That's right. My interest in this new disease started with that party, you see. Both you and Katsumi collapsed, right? He was right, actually. In my case, I'd been sent to that other world line. I met up with her again several days ago. She demanded to know why she was being sent back to the hospital when she was just fine. I see. Would you tell her it would make me happy if she was a bit more cooperative? Oh, oh. I actually feel really bad for both her and all the other patients. We in the Japanese team are doing what we can, but we just don't understand the results we're getting. Dr. Leskinen's usually chipper expression darkened. The man was such a ball of vitality that I hadn't noticed until then, but when his smile disappeared, I could see the wrinkles that had formed on his face from exhaustion. He must have been working hard, like he said. To be honest, none of the doctors thought we'd have this much trouble explaining it at the start. Uh... Mm -hmm. What's wrong, Lintolo? Oh, uh, well, I... Is there something wrong? No, I'm not a medical student, so this is all outside of my expertise. Just about to tell him about my reading Steiner, but in the end, I, I couldn't. If my uninformed opinion was wrong, it could cost the encephalitis patients their lives. I couldn't just tell him when I didn't have any proof. And then his face drew close to mine again. By the way, Katsumi was saying something very interesting. Oh? She said something about not being sick. About how she was actually experiencing another world in her dreams. Uh... I told her not to say anything about it. Could she not help it? This was bad. They might start to doubt her sanity. Well, Nakase's got a very vivid imagination, maybe. She does love sci-fi and anime. Probably just said she has the power to experience parallel worlds because she saw it on a TV show somewhere. I don't know, it's 2010. What anime's popular right now? <laughs> Remember I used to say stuff like that myself. <laughs> uh, I tried my best to come up with excuses, but Dr. Leskinen still seemed concerned. But still, I was really surprised when I started participating in the treatment project. One of the strange things about this illness is that many patients share the same dreams. I'm assuming it's similar to a mass hallucination. But what do you think? I've never seen this before. From a brain science perspective, I just don't have an answer right now. I'm... you're asking a non-medical student? To be honest, unscientific is the word that seems to best fit. Like parallel worlds or memories of a past life, you know. I, I see. It would help if you talked to Katsumi, too. Of course. There are some things you can't say to a doctor, but that you'll tell your friends. Okay, sure, I'll talk to her, I suppose. So, Lintolo, that aside, I have a question for you. Dr. Leskinen was looking over my shoulder. I got a sense of this at the Christmas party, but your girlfriends really are cute, aren't they? My what? Teen Girl Squad! <laughs> Teen, Teen Girl Squad! Teen Girl Squad? <laughs> I turned around and saw that Mayuri, Kaide, and Yuki had all stood up from the sofa and were looking at me. Wait, isn't Yuki like 20? Yeah. I think Yuki's 20, yeah. When they saw Dr. Leskin and was looking at them, they, they all waved. So, are any of these girls involved with you right now? Yuki, Kaede, Mayuri, Luka, or maybe Katsumi? What? I... His words were so surprising I couldn't think of anything to say. Maho would often call this middle-aged man a mischievous boy, and 
That was exactly what he lo had <laughs> the look he had on his face. No, I won't force you to tell me. I don't want to pry into your private life. I... Even though it is right in the name. It is right in the name, actually. <laughs> pry that life. But, oh, well, no. I'd hope to have something to tell my favorite student. Uh, what? <clears throat> Dr. Luskin had turned to walk away before I could figure out what he meant. All right, Lintolo, I've got to talk to the director a little more, so I'll be going. I'd love to go around to all those girls and give them a hug, too, but I'll save that for next time. Tell them I said hello. Oh, of course. Sure. Myri and the others came over to me as I watched him go. Was that Dr. Laskinen? Yeah, I knew I'd seen him somewhere before. I thought he'd gone back to America. <laughs> oh, Karin. There was no way I could tell the girls what Dr. Leskinen and I were just talking about. Uh. Okay, hold on. I need to explain something that just occurred to me. What? I was staring. You see the one advertisement in the upper right of the subway there that has all the panty covered asses on it? Yeah. I was staring at it for a really long time. Because I was looking at the title font design, and I was like, dang, that really pops, doesn't it? <laughs> what does that say? It starts with pawn. Pawn. Oh, I mean, obviously. <laughs> when you think about it, that makes a lot of sense when it starts with... <laughs> uh, we were just uh, looking at title design things the other day, and now my, my mind is, like, overly focused on it. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway, uh, panties. A game, I guess. <laughs> After Fubuki's exam was over, we went to her room and listened to her complain, and then the visit was over. Just like Dr. Leskinen had said, she looked f just fine. She told us she was ready to leave the hospital, then jog all the way home. Myri and the others were relieved, but I felt worried. Did I need to talk to Dr. Leskinen about reading Steiner after all? But how would I explain it? Might be a better idea to talk to Maho and have her explain it to him. So this is roughly the same events as the last time we were here, but we're o we're seeing different scenes and missing out on some of the others. So yeah. is Maho still brainwashed? I couldn't come to an answer right away. We said goodbye to Kaite and Yuki at one of the stations on the way back. Wait, does that on the upper left say blood covered? Is that a fucking, um, a fucking... It does say blood covered, yeah. Corpse party? Is that what that is? I don't know anything about Corpse Party. Cause, uh, when did this game come out? This was like 2016 that Zero came out, right? <laughs> Which is why we have Chaos Child in the background instead yeah. of Chaos Head. Um, was it Blood Covered totally was one of the remakes of Corpse Party, wasn't it? Blood. Corpse it Party, like Blood that? Covered. Uh, that it, is exactly that image. Is it? Look at that. That the, the One of the Google results. You see that? I fucking called it. That's so, exactly some of these are real also. Yeah. I wonder about the other ones now. That's exactly Corpse Party. Huh. <laughs> Today I learned. Before we got to Ikebukuro, I remembered to take out my phone and open the web browser. Went to at channel eager to see how she <laughs> responded to the bait I'd spread this afternoon. Oh I put my head over my mouth to stifle the noise. Hmm. I'm sorry, do I have something on my face? Myri had been standing next to me, and she was leaning over at my screen. It was Fitzgerald and Lawrence who based their hypothesis off that experiment. Einstein himself said it had nothing to do with his theories. You don't even know that? How ignorant are you? <laughs> <laughs> I fished her up all right. I didn't think it would go this well. The timestamp was from just 30 minutes ago. I decided to respond immediately using the same name, Salieri's neighbor. <laughs> you are the ignorant one. In a letter written before his death, Einstein said that he was aware of Mickelson and Morley's experiment. I posted and then reloaded the thread. It was already a response from her. <laughs> I know that. Duh. All he said was that he knew of the experiment. Obviously. 
Einstein used the Fizeau experiment and stellar aberration to come up with the theory of relativity. The time lag was just 21 seconds. It was kind of irritating to have her come after me so hard. It was as if she was insulting me as a person. Well, I was the one who had deliberately written in mistakes, so I should have expected it. <laughs> you just can't let anyone else win, can you? I see you haven't changed a bit. <laughs> Are you Mozart? The Thres other residents were probably confused, everyone except for her. Murray had been watching our exchange and looked at me confused. Do you know this Kuri Gohan and Kamehameha person? Yes, they're someone I've known for a long time. I think. Now then, how would she reply to the nickname Salieri's neighbor in the post I just wrote? I was curious, but there wasn't an immediate response like before. The train reached Ikebukuro station. Oh, Karin, we're here. The train slid into the station and stopped. I reloaded the thread one more time before the doors opened, and there was a very short response from Curry Gohan and Kamehameha. Who are you? There could be no doubt now. This Curry Gohan and Kamehameha was Kurusu. Ha 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 ha! Welcome to Walmart. <laughs> oh wait, no, no, she's got the less high version. Like, <laughs> welcome to Walmart. <laughs> <clears throat> it was a very hot day in 1998 when Suzaha said goodbye to Kagari Shina. She'd gone to get food and water from a local store, and when she'd come back and opened the hatch, Kagari was inside screaming. Oh come on! How does this stupid thing work? She looked inside and saw that Kagri was slamming her tiny hands down on the control console. <sighs> what are you doing? Uh... Kagri shrank back when she saw Suzuha. I'm not... This isn't what it looks like. Answer me. But, but... I woke up and you were gone and it was dark and the lights wouldn't turn on and it's so cramped and scary in here. So I tried to open the door. And then when I was fiddling with it, this happened. Kagari started to cry. I'm sorry, big sis Suzuha. I'm sorry, but I was really scared. <sighs> I see. Suzuha relaxed her guard. Kagari had PTSD from her time as a war orphan, and she hadn't fully recovered yet. Myri had once told her that she got very frightened in dark and cramped places. It would make sense if wake, waking up in the dark caused a panic attack. And the time machine could only function with Suzuha's biometric authorization. Someone of Kagari's size wouldn't be able to break the console either. You passed out from the shock of time travel, so I wanted you to let you get some rest. I'm sorry. Oh, time travel, it feels like being drunk. <laughs> That's not so bad. That's... Ask a glass of water. Like it. <laughs> <laughs> sure, great. Suzuha grabbed one of Kagari's tiny hands to help her up, and then led her outside the machine. I feel like we haven't had a single Douglas Adams reference until then so far in this, which... That's impressive, actually. ...is impressive, given that, like... Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Damn. Well. <clears throat> wow, it's so hot. Kagari, promise me that you won't touch the switches on the control console, no matter what. Okay? O okay. I'm going to get started. You go and rest, okay? Have some food and water if you want it. Suzaha handed Kagri the provisions she'd bought, then went inside and poked her head into the cargo space under the con under the control console. She connected the IBM 5100 she'd stored there to a portable terminal she'd brought from the future. By all appearances, it was an early 2000s cell phone, but inside it was a miniaturized quantum computer from the year 2036. Of course, Dar future Daru had made it himself. When she booted up the IBM 5100, rows of numbers started to appear on the screen. What are you doing? Numbers, numbers, math, math, math. Kagari was looking in from the out outside the machine. <sighs> Did you study the year 2000 problem? 
I studied it a little at the orphanage. In the end, nothing happened, right? That's what everyone thinks, yeah. Huh? It wasn't made public, but at the time, a lot of places and a lot of countries had serious problems because of it. Really? The issue was this computer, the IBM 5100. It's got an old programming language on it, and the engineers weren't able to fix the program. In fact, they didn't even know that an important program existed when it was ri that was written in this language. The race to develop the time machine was the beginning of the Third World War, but uh, there's a chance that something that happened during the year 2000 problems, and the divisions that resulted from that were a deeper cause. She didn't expect a ten-year-old like Kagari to understand this, but she didn't feel like taking the time to explain, either. And the year 2000 is a special year, you see. All the world lines temporarily converge here. It means that it's possible the year 2000 problem has a huge effect on all the world lines. The world line in the gap that we're trying to reach, Stein's Gate, is no exception. She looked down at the terminal connected to the IBN 5100. So this is a patch program to keep the year 2000 problem from ever happening. Right now, the terminal is converting the patch into the language used by the IBN 5100. The next step was to spread this program all around the world in the form of a virus. And the year 2000 problems that this era's engineers missed would completely disappear. The word connect appeared on the terminal subscreen. Alright, it's connected. She'd been told that in Japan, in this era, ADSL was still at the test phase and that most normal users connected to the internet by now by low-speed dial-up using ISDN. But in a major city, city areas like Akihabara, universities, labs, and some big computer companies were starting to use fiber optic broadband. Some of them were even using wireless LANs. Suzuha cracked her way into one of those. Dan had laughed when he said that with 2036 technology, cracking the late 20th century network security was a joke, but he'd been right. But if you change the future, won't that change the world we're in? Surprisingly, Kagri had gotten the gist of what Suzuha had just told her. That's right. I refuse to let that world exist any longer, so I came here to reach Stein's Gate. Hmm. Suddenly, the uneasy look on Kagri's face vanished. It was as if her soul had left its body. Suddenly, her face was expressionless and her eyes were wide. Voice. I can hear God's voice. Uh, Cockery? You can't do that. It's not right. You can't do that, Big Sis Suzuha. You can't. Uh, what? Cockery was acting strangely. Suspiciously, Suzuha reached her hand out towards her. But... She slipped past Suzuha's hand. And quicker than any child should be able to move, she slammed her shoulder straight into Suzuha's body. Ah! Suzuha was caught completely off guard. That's how fast it was. Kagari's shoulder hit her in the solar plexus. Ah! She bent over and collapsed onto the seat. Kagari tore the terminal out of Suzuha's hands. The cables connecting it to the IBAN 5100 were ripped out, and errors displayed on both screens. What are you doing? Kagari didn't answer the question. Instead, she grabbed the backpack that Suza had placed on the seat and spilled its contents onto the floor. There were MREs, spare parts, clothes, and a semi-automatic pistol. Suzuha couldn't believe it. Kagari was going to try and pick it up. Stop it! She forced herself to ignore the pain as she jumped on Kagari's body. But another unbelievably powerful body slam knocked her back. Ah! Something cold was pushed right up against her brow. Don't move. Kagari's tiny hands weren't shaking at all as they clutched the semi-automatic pistol. In the space of an instant, the safety on the gun had been flipped off. That's when Suzuha realized this wasn't just a temper tantrum. Suzuha was the one who taught her how to use a gun. That's why she knew that Kagari was perfectly calm. Are you insane? Put the gun down now! Stop doing this! You're the one who needs to stop. What? You can't change the world. You're not making sense. There was no hesitation in her eyes. Instead, Suzuha Hassala saw only resolve. Do you want the war to happen then? I don't know anything about that. I just want to go back to my old world. Then that's never going to happen. 
We've already used the time machine to interfere with the past. The world line has changed. There's almost no chance we can go back. Shut up. Shut up. I'm going to save mommy. You can't erase this world. I won't let you. Kagari turned the gun toward the IVN 5100. Stop! Before Suzuha could stop her, she yanked down on the trigger. Again and again and again. Stop, Kagari, please! Stop! And then Kagari jumped out of the time machine, and Suzuha never saw her again. On every night that passed, she remembered Kagari. Suza had spent some time looking for her when she'd first come to this era, but in the end, she'd never found anything. But Kagari Shina, who was now 22 years old, was here in Akihabara. Suza was sure of it. Oh, Mahotan. Hey. Hey. Itaro was sitting at the computer next to Suza and talking into his monitor. The monitor was displaying a video chat screen, and on the screen was a young girl dressed in slovenly fashion. <clears throat> no, sorry, a proper fully grown lady dressed in a slovenly fa- <laughs> oh. <laughs> Hide the dialogue box so we can see background Suzuha. There we go. Oh. Uh, <laughs> Skype with Maho USA. <laughs> uh, yeah. <laughs> Oh, this is very, very good. Oh, that's delightful. Okay, sorry. I needed to appreciate that for a moment. Morning. It was 8.30 p.m. at the Future Gadget Lab in Akihabara. Meanwhile, Victor Condria was an hour off from usual due to daylight savings time, and it was 7.30 a.m. Half eight? She's never been up at half eight. Half eight? Half eight? I've never been awake at half eight. What happens? <laughs> Yajo, are, are you all right? It's early. She probably just got up. Why am I the one on camera? Maho was a mess. Her hair was never combed right, but her eyes were bloodshot and her gaze was wandering. The spots under her eyes were too dark for the little bit of makeup she'd applied to cover up. Her cheeks were sunken, which made her look even tinier than usual. On top of all that, her skin was terribly pale. She looked like something out of a zombie movie. Anemic Mahotan for the win. I have no idea what you just said. But just in case, fuck you. <laughs> Valid. Normally she would have gotten upset at Itaru's joke, but either she'd gotten used to it or simply given up because she said nothing. How are things going on over there? No, I've managed to rebuild it to how it was before Okarin took it apart. I think it does most of what it did before. Ataru glanced toward the development room, past the curtain in the back of the lab. Right now, he was working with Maho to recreate what Okabe had called the Time Leap Machine. Ah, yes! We're back to this. <laughs> it's not going well. Yeah, it's just not stable. It ends up being a normal microwave. All right, because he doesn't know about the lifter or, like, any of the other things. He just knows about the rope mechanics that went into building the object. I see... I wonder what's wrong with it. If we could ask Okarin, I'm sure things would be different. We can't do that. He'd get really mad if he even knew we were working on this. Uncle's afraid. He's afraid of the power of the world line convergence. Won't be easy to convince him. In fact, it had almost been a year since she'd first tried and failed. Hmm. There was a moment of silence. <sighs> Wait, Mahotan, are you asleep? Nah. <laughs> 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 and Suzo's reaction. <laughs> I'm convinced that Maho was introduced to this game just to give us a character who can make very good faces. <laughs> All of Maho's faces are in are just very, very good. <laughs> <laughs> Maho's whole body jerked and she almost fell out of her chair. Ah, it wasn't close. I almost went back to bed before he left for work. 
You know, you're working too hard. If you get sick, it'll only slow us down, you know? Yeah, I'm fine. <laughs> this is my fine face. <laughs> my fine face. Actually, after all this work, I'm still not as good as a real genius. I don't think so. You know, I think you're a genius. I don't need you to make me feel better. I've got all these hints about the time leap machine that Okabe told me about, and I still can't find the answer. How did she manage to compress all that memory data and send it into the past? Chris managed to do it, but I... Maho seemed upset. It was obvious even through the monitor. Oh, I'm, I'm sorry. This isn't the time to complain, is it? Is there anything else to report for today? If not, I'm gonna go ahead to work. There's one more thing. Suzuha looked at Itaru. About what you'd asked me to look into? Yeah, did you find something? Nothing clear yet. I see. I've done some breaking and entering into a bunch of networks and taken things about as far as it's safe to do so. I'm not blaming you. Just tell me what you know. No, if you want to start screaming insults, I wouldn't mind that at all. Dad! Hurry, I'm running out of time. Sure, sure. Itaru opened a different window on the monitor. He displayed one of the text files in it. It was a record of information Itaru and Suzuha had collected. First, the incident where you were attacked in the hotel basement. The cops say it was some kind of crazy cultist on a drug trip, but that's definitely a lie. A lie? Just like the police announcement said, he was an assistant professor at a college. And that's fine, but I can't find anything linking him to a cult at all. I tried accessing public safety's secret data file on the cult, too, so I'm certain of it. So they're just... just straight up lying. If you look at At Channel, you'll sometimes see people who look like they're from the cult, claiming that they're innocent and that the whole thing's a conspiracy. Whenever that happens, the haters show up instantly, and they beat the daylights out of the guy. And the haters always have this really well-made fake evidence, digitally altered images and stuff. There's no way that's a coincidence. Really? I mean, I don't know a lot about this ad channel thing. Most of the big sites have agents on them, including ad channel. Okay. And they get paid like it's a business, so they do it 24 hours a day, from morning till night. Information control. It's propaganda. Politicians and bureaucrats use them to influence public opinion on the net. There are even companies that specialize in this sort of thing. I see. I, I guess I can understand that. America has the same thing. These agents can change their IP, but they can't hide from me. So I did some research, and there's an insane amount of agents assigned to that case. It's to the point where I have no idea where the money cut to pay them is coming from. Oh, I see. What about the attack on your workplace, Dad? Same deal. The police had called it a fight between foreign mafias trying to expand territory in Japan. The media never questioned the story at all, and even people on the boards of the famously skeptical at channel believed everything they were told. Of course, there was no mention whatsoever of Russia or CERN. What happened to the HK Museum? <laughs> I was invested in that. <laughs> So, I decided to post a thread where I pretended to be a witness and said I saw some Russian special forces. And wow, was I amazed. Talk about some serious try-hard trolling. I got pissed enough that I almost doxed the agent's real name, his company name, and everything else. Evidently, he'd been really irritated. It was rare for Itaro to get so angry, or maybe it wasn't, she decided. Uh... <laughs> In other words, pressure came down from somewhere to shut down discussion, right? That's Japan for you. Real free country. America's no different, is it? Eh, you got that right. The two of them smiled at the joke. Sad Susa in the corner. <laughs> anyway, so that's all I can do. I see. 
That's enough. Thank you. Hey, Ajo, do you think you can get permission from the lab to come to Japan? Well, I keep sending requests to go as Dr. Leskin's assistant, but they keep turning them down. Dr. Leskin is here now, right? Yeah, he's researching the new encephalitis. Right, and she's not in Japan right now, so she's yep. not brainwashed. Yep. Probably. Well, yeah, because if they had gone to the trouble of brainwashing her, they would have brought her along to actually make use of it. Since it had nothing to do with artificial intelligence, it seemed Maho wouldn't be allowed to go along. That's fine. They keep turning me down. I've got ideas of my own. Did you know that? I did some research on this. Did you know that legally they have to give you what's called a... a vac vacation? <laughs> do, do they? <laughs> I hope so. What are you going to do? Don't tell me you're going to defy your superior officer's orders to drop the case, and then you'll get caught by the bad guys. I've seen that hentai before. Is that a, is that a hentai trope? <laughs> Actually, don't tell me. I don't want to know. I'm just fascinated that you know. Like, again, this is an academic fascination of your depth of knowledge with one very specific and narrow medium. <laughs> hey, hey, Maho, say, kill me in as frustrated a voice as possible. What? Dad! Suzuha's hand went for her back pocket. <laughs> Reaching for her gun. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Itaru's shoulders slumped as he apologized. Lately, she'd been able to put a stop to Itaru's terrible jokes just by doing that. She wasn't sure if it was a good thing or a bad thing that she knew exactly how to handle him. Well, anyway. I should be there before too long, yeah? Okay, well, tell us when you got a date, alright? Oh, and Hiajo, if you're gonna, going to work, you should take another look in the mirror first. Just before they ended the call, Suzuha decided to warn her. What? <laughs> Maho stood up and walked toward the closet without turning off the camera. She vanished from view, but a moment later... Yeah! <laughs> she must have seen how terrible she looked, because she let out a very unfeminine scream. Why am I the butt monkey of, like, every joke in this game? <laughs> no, really. I'm a cool character. Why do I have to be the butt monkey? <laughs> they relaxed for a moment after turning off the video chat. Suzuha thought back to the time before she'd become a time traveler. She did this every time she got off the video chat with Maho. Ah. Maho Hiajo. Someone who helped build the time machine, huh? Uh. It was after Maho had gone back to America that she'd volunteered to help Suza and Itaru with the time machine. That meant when Itaru Hashida completed the time machine 25 years from now, Maho Hiajo must have contributed in some way. But... I know I shouldn't say too much about the future, but there was nobody by that name helping you, you know? Oh? Uh, really? Which means she probably left the team at some point. I don't know whether it was of her own free will or due to some external factor, but if nothing else, I don't think she was part of the core team. I see. She's pretty handy to have around, though. I don't want to say this, but there's a possibility she might be a spy. What? No way. Not Mahotan, of all people. Sorry. I just want you to remember that it's a possibility, okay? I told you, the war of information that comes before the Third World War has already started. Hmm. Either way, you, we can't let anyone find out the machine's secrets. Just make sure you're very careful about it, alright? Yeah. So how are you going to work the time machine going forward? Hmm, we really need Okarin's help. That's the thing. I don't know if we can persuade him. I might have to do it by force. Who was it that tried that before and then it failed? <sighs> ah. Suzuha pursed her lips. Even with a gun in his face, Ringtaro Okabe still wouldn't get in the time machine. To be honest, Suzuha was out of options. She stifled a sigh. It didn't do any good to let herself get down. I want to think of it. How are things with Mom? Hmm? I'm more worried about that right now. Is everything all right? I, I'm still going to be boring, right? Oh, well, is that more important than the time machine? Hey! 
¿Por qué no los dos? <laughs> Suza has stormed over to Itaru. You can't screw this up, Dad. Yeah, Daddy's gonna do his best, okay? All you ever do is talk. You wasted those movie tickets we gave you, didn't you? She meant the pair of movie tickets that Myri and Ferris had conspired to give them at the Christmas party. That was because Okarin and Ms. Fubuki collapsed, you know? We were so busy with hospital visits and stuff that the movie left the theater. It's not like it's my fault. But I heard that when they try to give you new tickets, you turn them down. Who told you that? Big Sis Mayu and Big Sis Rumi, obviously. That's because, you know, it's not very manly to make those two do all the work, is it? So, did you go and do something yourself? This isn't going to work. Maybe this was a more important problem than the time machine. Suzuha brought her hands up to her head. Listen, Dad, I'm not going to be around to lecture you like this forever, all right? I'm leaving soon. Oh. Suddenly, there was a sad look in Itaru's eyes. Don't make that face at me. I promised I'd stop worrying about it. For the past six months, Suzuha had been thinking about whether it was really right to erase this world. But in the end, it was none other than Itaru who'd pushed her to go ahead. I'm sorry. She couldn't bear to see her father so depressed, so she patted his broad back. Don't just sit there and be glum. Send mom a message and see if she's free sometime, all right? And if she is, invite her to a movie. Ugh, that's way too sudden. I don't care if it's sudden or not. Do it anyway, all right? This is an order. An order. What's your answer? Sir, yes, sir. Satisfied, she headed off to take a shower. Oh, but before that, I'm gonna hit the convenience store. I actually haven't eaten yet, so I'm probably going to be up all night again. So I want to get there before it gets too late. Still hunched over, he pointed toward the development room. He's pointing at the phone wave named subject to change, Unit-02, that was put together but still undergoing testing. Ah. Ugh, don't glare at me like that. I'll eat as healthy as I can, so please forgive me. Vanilla! Huh? I want ice cream when I'm done with my shower. Vanilla ice cream! Okay, I'll go buy you a lot of really top-shelf stuff. Doesn't have to be a lot, just one thing is fine. Sir, yes sir. That was enough to cheer Daru up. He took his wallet and ran out of the lab. He is such a handful. She had just about taken off her jacket so she could take that shower, but... Suzuha. Itaru had come back into the lab. So this is different, too. Yeah, this is different, too. What is it? I found this on the stairs. Itaro showed her a keychain he was holding. It's a round anime character whose color had faded to a smoky green. It was an Upa. You know whose this is. Uh, Big Sis Mayu's, probably? She leaned forward to take a closer look and then felt like she was experiencing deja vu. I've seen this Upa somewhere before. She'd seen it before. She couldn't really remember when, but her internal alarms were going off. This keychain was extremely important. <sighs> Upas were common enough you could find them anywhere. The plastic edges had worn down, the paint was faded and coming off in places. But there was no dust and there were no stains. Instead, it shone brightly as if its owner had put a lot of effort in taking good care of it. The chain was so old that part of it had snapped off. That's probably how it got dropped. Where was it? I've seen this before! Did Mayushi show it to you? Don't know! She stared at the green upa in Itaru's hands, and then in her mind she heard a young girl scream. This is Mommy's upa keychain. I'm giving it to you. Take good care of it, okay? Huh? She gasped. A feeling of indescribable terror raced down her spine. This can't be. Is that Cockeries? 
That was when she'd last seen it, August 13th, 2036. The day she'd gone into the time machine, that's when she'd seen this Upa. It was older and more worn now, but the more she remembered that day, the more certain she became this was the Upa that Mayuri had given to Kagari. She'd seen Kagari holding it and crying to herself many times before. Kagari, you mean future Ms. Mayu's daughter? Yeah. Did you find her? No, but she knows where I am. What do you mean? She's watching this lab. Satisfied, she headed off to take a shower. Ever since then, her careful efforts to defend the time machine had paid off, and she hadn't seen any sign of Kagari, but she never thought she'd be watching the lab. Oh, it would have been obvious if I'd given it any thought. She's trying to stop us from reaching Stein's gate. She doesn't want this world to end. I mean, she's watching not just me, but you too? Huh? Me? I don't think your life is in danger. I mean, probably. If you believe what we know about how world lines work, you live to at least 2036, right? She might have come to interfere with your research, so we can't reach Stein's gate. A lot of bad things have been happening around Suzuha, Itaru, and Rintaro Okabe. There was some possibility that the final target was Itaru. Come to think of it, what happens to this Suzuha? We know that there aren't two Suzuhas by the time we get to 2036. So at some point between now and then, she dies. How? She tries to go back. She tries to go back. That's how. Thank you. I totally forgot that that was addressed already. Yeah. So from now on, just to be safe, lock the door whenever I'm not around. Okay, got it. Even if Uncle Ocarine, Mom, or Big Sis Mayu are here, don't leave it open. Might not help much, but make sure you use the door chain, too. You know, Ocarine and Mayu share one thing, but if I did that when I was alone with Amaneshi, don't you think that'd give her the wrong idea? <sighs> That's true. If that makes her not like me, my whole family could be in trouble. Ah. Uh. Suzuha groaned softly, unsure of what to do. If only gotten her to be her boyfriend sooner, there just wouldn't be a problem. Wait, we're back to that? Hey, you started it. Just be careful, okay? Suzuha decided to keep the green Upa keychain. She softly rang her fingertips over it as she stared at it. Hey, Suzuha, Kagari Tan's not related to Mayushi, but she's still her daughter, right? That's right. Could somebody raised by Mayushi grow up to be the kind of person who'd assault someone? I just can't imagine it. From what you've told me, I'd expect her to be a kind, easygoing, and cute little girl. I wish that was what had happened. And I thought that's how she'd turn out as well. But now she's probably... From what she'd seen at the radio building, she could tell Kagari had definitely received professional combat training. It wasn't just the simple self-defense techniques that she'd learned from Suzuha when she was a child. As she'd grown up, she'd been taught the cold techniques of a killer. There was no way to know where she'd been or what she'd been doing ever since she'd gone missing in 1998. Mayushi, your daughter has the cold, dead eyes of a killer. <laughs> More black books, really? Yes, I'm so sorry. But there was no doubt in Suzuha's mind that she was trying to ruin her plans. Anyway, we couldn't go without the Suzuha shower scene. <laughs> Suzuha sighed as she took her shower. Since it was summer, she'd set the water temperature low, barely any hotter than tap water. As long as the water was pouring down on her, she could feel all the bad memories were being washed away. Slapped her cheeks with both hands and turned off the water. The small tiled room suddenly became quiet. In the silence, she vigorously toweled off her hair. The building was never intended for anyone to live in. Not only was there very little room, it wasn't even a place to change. It was small and there were no windows, and the steam from the shower room built up, making it an unpleasant sauna in the summer. Supposedly, Yutaro and Okabe would sit naked next to the fans to get away from the heat and moisture. Of course, that was only when the girls, as well as Luca, weren't around. <laughs> the girls, including Luca. <laughs> <laughs> but Suzuha couldn't do that. There were those huge scars on her chest. If she was careless and Yuki saw them, she'd have a big problem. So she always forced herself to change within this small space. Huh? 
The second she left the shower room, she realized something was wrong. The lights were off in the part behind the curtain where the lab room was. She was sure she had left all the lab lights on when she'd gone to take a shower. She didn't remember turning them off. Still completely naked, she flung open the curtain. She dropped to the floor, ready to move. She could tell by the light from the shower room that there was no one else there. She didn't hear any breathing. She didn't feel any other presence. Okay, so it's not the same as... Did Dad come back? And then when he left, he turned off the lights? And that couldn't be right. She looked around the room and saw that things had been moved in a way that an amateur wouldn't be able to notice. Itaro's computer desk, the sofa area, the bookshelves, even the mini kitchen, someone had gone through them all. For the look of it, the same was probably true of the development room. Susa had glanced over all the areas where she kept her guns. The closet was the sofa. The closest was the sofa that she used as a bed. She wanted to have one easily available if she was attacked while she slept. She cut out the back of one of the sofa cushions and hid in a suppressed semi-automatic pistol in it. It was only a 32 caliber for self-defense, so it wouldn't do much damage unless you had, got, had good aim. But it was small and relatively quiet, which made it the best choice for a place like this. Susa had tensed all her muscles, coiling like a spring, and slowly turned toward the sofa without making a sound. If she did, she tried to notice any changes in the surrounding area. There was a small sound in the development room. The tiny, tiny creaking of the floor to which you'd usually pay no mind. But that was more than enough for Susa. In an instant, she moved from quiet to action. She cleared the distance of the sofa in a single movement and quickly drew her gun. She held it ready and slipped into the shadow of the refrigerator. From this position, she could barely see into the development room. Hey, Calgary! What's good? The room became silent again, but this time the intruder in the other room didn't try to hide their presence. Try anything and I'll shoot. Hands on your head and come out slowly. Suza threatened the intruder in a low voice, but the intruder seemed completely unconcerned as they exposed themselves to Suzuha's gaze. Hmm. Must be pretty hot wearing that in this weather, huh? Why not at least take off your helmet? The intruder was wearing a motorcycle suit just like before. Even the helmet was the same. The leather suit clung tight to their skin, revealing a voluptuous and perfectly proportioned body. It was clearly a woman. What you're looking for isn't there, anyway. It's in my pocket. Wait, so is this exactly the same as before, then? I could have sworn that this happened differently last time, but this suddenly all seems the same. Yeah, it feels like it's been long enough that I'm having... Like, cause some parts seem different and some parts seem similar. It's hard to... Hmm. Suzuha pointed toward the entrance of the shower room. The shirt she'd just taken off was lying there on the floor. The girl in the motorcycle suit turned her head, but because the face mask was down, Suzuha couldn't read her expression. She know better than to drop that. It's something Mommy gave you, after all. Right, Kagari? The second she spoke, Kagari Shina was the first to move. She drew a deglossed military knife that she must have been hiding behind her back and closed the gap between herself and Suzuha in an instant. Suzuha pointed the gun at her legs and pulled the trigger, carefully aiming away from her vitals. She heard the small pop of a suppressed 32 and saw Kagari lose her balance and fall. Or she thought she did, but it was a feint. Huh? She'd only pretended to lose her balance. In fact, she changed direction to was heading for the shower room. And her first goal was to get what she'd come for. What? After firing only one shot, Suzuha realized even a 32 should have more recoil than this. Huh? She fired again, but Kagri didn't even flinch for a moment. A blank? How? At some point, all the bullets in Suzuha's gun had been swapped with blanks. That instant's panic was all panic was all it took. Kagri reached out for the shirt on the floor in front of the shower room. No way! Suzuha gave up on firing and flung the gun at. <laughs> yeah, just fucking toss it at her. Why not? A gun is a ranged weapon. A gun is a ranged weapon. There was a dull thud as the hard barrel slammed into her neck. Caught off balance, she staggered before she could grab the shirt. Ugh. She could hear Kagri's voice for the first time from within the helmet. Suzuha jumped. She kicked the off-balance Kagri as hard as she could with her toned, muscled legs. This was no time to hold back. Kagri went flying all the way to the edge of the room, but it had to have broken a few ribs. Suzuha jumped toward her to continue her attack. But with terrifying speed, Kagri leapt off the ground and charged at Suzuha. 
wasn't enough time to come to a full stop. Nah. A sharp blade swept by mere centimeters from her exposed abdomen. If she'd pulled back even a few tenths of a second later, the knife would have fatally sliced open her gut. You bitch! The blood rushed to Suzuha's head. Calgary was serious. She was planning to kill her. There was no hesitation in her movements. Suzuha leapt back and searched for something she could use as a weapon. But the other guns were probably no different. There was a good chance they'd all had their ammo swapped with blanks as well. It's even possible their self-defense knives had been taken too. Which left... There were several knives carefully stored in the kitchen. Yuki had brought them over to use in teaching the other girls how to cook. But Kagri had evidently noticed them as well, and she was moving to keep Suzuha from reaching them. Huh, looks like you've had a lot of practice, huh? Hard to believe you're the same girl who spent all her time sobbing inside the time machine. I'm surprised. Suzuha kept her distance from Kagri as she slowly moved along the wall. Her competitive drive burned even brighter as she tried to come up with a way to overcome her disadvantage. Here, Kagari, it's what you're after, right? She picked up her shirt from in front of the shower room and took the green keychain out of its pockets. What's wrong? Come and get it. Her fingers moved as if to crush it. She could see Kagari twitch. For the first time, she could detect a hint of emotion beyond the helmet. And in an instant, she threw it at Kagari's stomach. The keychain flew in a slow arc like she was tossing it to a friend. Something they love was thrown like that, even the fiercest warrior would instinctively reach out both hands to grab it. Kagari was no exception. She carefully held her mother's memento in both her empty left hand and the right hand that still clutched the knife. Ha ha! Using the slow arc of the keychain as camouflage, Shizuha ran at her in a straight line. Her right fist connected hard with Kagari's stomach. Then her left arm smashed Kagari's head to the side. Ugh. Kagari's body fell to the ground, her right shoulder taking the brunt of the fall. Suza could hear the sound of her joint dislocating. The knife slipped from her grasp. Suza got behind her and mounted her, twisting her right arm mercilessly. At the same time, she slipped down her own left arm around Kagari's neck and squeezed hard. Ugh. 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 She could hear something like a moan from Kagari's throat. She could both hear and feel the bones in her arm and neck creaking. Stay put! I'm not going to kill you! But Kagari picked up the knife on the floor with her left hand and once again tried to use it on Suzuha. Suza was forced to squeeze her arm and neck even harder. <laughs> Stop it, Kagari! I understand how you feel now, but it's wrong! It's wrong! But Kagari didn't stop. If anything, she tried even harder to pull Suzuha away. What kind of training did she get? Even in all the battles she'd been in, this much pressure on two different spots was enough to get even the toughest soldier to submit or fall unconscious. Terrified, Suzuha squeezed even harder. At this rate, she wouldn't simply knock her out. She really would kill Kagari. But if she stopped, Kagari would kill her. What should she do? It says Suzuha. It hurts. It hurts. And then she heard a sad, weak voice from inside the helmet. It startled her, and she relaxed both her arms. That was just what Kagari had hoped for. The knife came very close to cutting Suzuha's left arm. When she let go to dodge it, Kagari shook her off and kicked at her hips with both legs. Suzuha was slammed back hard into the computer desk, and for a moment she couldn't breathe. She fell to the floor, and the printer and monitor crashed mercilessly into her naked body. Uh, uh, uh. She forced herself to stand up, gasping hard as she did so. Kagari's breath was heavy as well. Her right arm was pointed in an impossible direction and hanging limp. She wouldn't be able to use it for a while, probably. But her left arm was still holding the knife. You've learned some dirty tricks, haven't you? Suzuha glared at Kagari's face. Not that she could see what it looked like behind that helmet. Huh. Hmm. The two of them fell silent as they tried to catch their breath. The tension in the air was so thick that it was difficult to move a muscle. Sweat rolled down her forehead and into her eyes, but she still didn't blink as she waited for Kagri to make her next move. It was the sound of the front door opening that broke their stalemate. 
Hey, Suzuha, did I just hear a loud noise? Suzuha felt a chill run down her spine when she heard Itaru's voice. No? Why is it so dark? No, Dad, stay back! She yelled at the exact same instant he turned on the lights. The sudden brightness was enough to make Suzuha flinch for an instant. Kagari was wearing a full face helmet, and that made all the difference. She leapt towards Itaru just a moment before Suzuha. Uh huh? Kagari's black knife went up to his throat. Dad! Uh, uh, uh. Kagari spun around behind him, using Itaru's huge body as a shield. Suzuha staggered toward him, gritting her teeth. Let go, Kagari. Hmm. Lay one finger on Dad. I don't care who you are, Kagari. I will kill you. Hmm. But Kagari remained silent as she headed outside the door with her hostage. And then in the next moment, she shoved him forward. Ah. Itaro lost his balance and fell towards Suzuha. Suzuha fell to the ground underneath his weight. He just barely managed to support himself with his arms and legs to keep from crushing her. Move! Suzuha tried to shove him off using a little more force than she may have intended, but her tower was so huge it would take him a moment to get up. This is why I told you to lose weight, you know. What? She was getting away. She somehow managed to crawl out from under him and quickly tried to follow after Kagari. Suzuha, wear this. Itaro was still lying on the ground as he tossed the naked Suzuha her shirt. She grabbed it quickly, put it on, then ran outside. Ah! But when she looked around the street, the girl in the motorcycle leathers wasn't there. There's was no way to even know where she'd gone. Damn it! She got away. And just like last time we did this scene, I think we're going to end it there. <laughs> All right. Oh, uh, yeah. So, like, a lot of this seems similar. But obviously, we're getting different context and stuff is measurably different. Indeed. Because Maho is working with the ti- on the time leap machine with Daru in this one. Yeah. And isn't here. Strange. We'll have to see what else is different next time. Next time. Next time. Bye. Smash, smash, like, comment, and subscribe.